Well, hey, friends, welcome back to How to Eat an Elephant, where one of our number is about to become a world traveler. Is this so? Yes, it's so. Oh, sorry, I, I almost missed my my entrance. <laughs> I didn't realize it was me. It's me, guys. It's I, me is Megan, by the way, for those of you listening. You don't have to give us any itinerary details or anything like that, but just just whisper the name of this of this glorious place that you get to go see. I'm going to Italy, dudes. <laughs> so I know, I'm so excited. That is incredible. No, it's going to be so fun. Anyways, I'll come back, you know, with so many great stories that perhaps those of you on the air will hear. We will find out. I mean, it depends on if it's a great trip or a disastrous trip. Um, I think there'll be stories either way, but they'll oh, be yes. different in tone. Oh, certainly. Well, I think the question on my mind, and I'm sure all of our listeners' minds is, are you bringing Les Miserables with you on your journey? Well... I think any experienced travelers in our midst will know the answer to that one, which is this is a door stopper and it doesn't fit in a carry on. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a big fat no. That's kind of <laughs> awesome. Oh, man. Well, we shall miss you. Thank you. <laughs> I will miss you too, you elephant eaters, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're in book three of what volume is this at this point? We're in Eponine, right? Ep- nope. Uh, the uh, Saint Denis. And Idol of the Rue Plume. That's right. Oh. That's right. I don't know. It's the only volume that doesn't have a Ooh, title um... that is a name. Yeah, that's right. Because after this volume, it's Jean Valjean, and, the, and then the thing is over. You guys, we've made what? some crazy progress through this book. We are Give yourselves a little, a little pat on the back. Clap your hands about yourself. This is pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. So the house in the Rue Plume is aptly titled, given that literally it is all about this house. I thought it was really beautiful, though. I mean, for reading about the layout of a house, the origin of a house, the house's garden, I was kind of riveted. <laughs> I'm not even being funny. Like, I think it was beautiful. He had, he, he like goes into house. some flights of philosophical fancy, employs some poetry that I thought was really kind of yes. moving. What do you guys think he... What So what is it about the house? Well, so what I got from this um, is that the house was designed with some secret passageway type things yeah. between like the outbuilding and the house itself, because it was designed for the purpose of continuing an affair, a tryst. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting. There's a um, a secret purpose to the buildings, which we've seen before in that building. I can't remember its name right now. That Corbo house. Yeah, Gorbo House was strange and had like weird rooms and there was an air of secrecy. This one also has an air of secrecy, but it was meant to to um, cover something that was wrong before. Mm-hmm. And now it's going to be used for other secret means, but maybe not quite so um, nefarious, you know? Yeah, to protect something good instead. Right. He seems to be drawing out a, a contrast on purpose. Yeah. It was cool. It is cool, though, to have the description. Sometimes when Hugo goes to describe something like buildings or streets and stuff. Mm -hmm. I get a little bored, but this was actually kind of awesome. I mean, the the notion of the guy buying the piece of land, buying the house and then buying all the land around it so that he could build a narrow passageway over the course of like a third of a mile um, so that the guys renting the gardens on either side wouldn't even know that that passageway was there. Like a lot of commitment. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it, it definitely creates this, the feeling and the sensation of being in a little oasis away from the rest of the world. Yeah. Which, of course, is perfect for the man we know Jean Valjean to be. But it's not all about the fact that it can't be accessed from anywhere. It's also about this garden that's attached to it. And that's where a lot of the beautiful descriptions come in. What did you guys make of the of the garden? Are we looking at some mm. sort of literary symbol here? I think it's a little interesting. It's It complicates an image that we have been following throughout this novel, which is the gardener. Mm. Um so Jean Valjean is the gardener. Uh, the bishop at the beginning was a gardener. Uh, Marius's friend was a gardener. But um, and then so obviously I circled where it says and Jean Valjean gave Cosette the garden. Like mm-hmm. oh now Cosette's a gardener, except for she's not. This this garden has been run to seed, mm-hmm. and they've decided to keep it that way. And then Hugo goes on a long rant about how really it's it's better that way that Mm. that it's natural it's another eden um instead of being he he uses a lot of really negative words um for a cultivated garden he says uh let's see 
this coquettish garden once so compromised had returned to virginity and modesty a judge assisted by a gardener a man who thought he was a second lamignon and another man who thought he was a second lenault don't know what that means yeah <laughs> um he had Same. distorted it pruned it crumpled it bedizened it fashioned it for gallantry nature had taken it over again and had filled it with shade and arranged it for love mm. so instead of cultivating a garden being something positive in this case like it has been before at least i think in the images of jean valjean and company here to to cultivate the garden is to distort it and to allow nature to take it over again is to arrange it for love interesting <laughs> i wonder though i'm seeing a slightly different shade in there because i think it has to do with not the fact that it was cultivated, but the fact that he was using it rather than caring for it, mm -hmm. right? Like he arranged his garden for the purpose of pursuing an illicit affair. That was why it was there. And that was why he planted whatever plants he planted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other gardeners that we've seen in the piece have done it for the love of it, for the love of flowers and for the love of growing things. And that's the same mm -hmm. way that it's described here. Nothing in the garden opposed the sacred urge toward life unhampered growth was at home there right there's something about it that is for the sake of life in an elemental sense what do you think Megan? although i can see what emily's saying because on the next page after where you were reading um hugo clarifies there's something about this garden liberty the absence of man the presence mm. of god and the old rusty grating that seemed to say this garden is mine so a separation really between the natural world and man's presence so rather than mm. man being like a co-heir with with the divine in gardening mm -hmm. it's the there's something holier about nature untouched mm -hmm. yeah god is the gardener of this garden mm -hmm. although I'm, here i am contradicting my own self um he says a little bit later in that same section nature frustrates the paltry arrangements of man and always gives its whole self where it gives itself at all mm. so regardless of man's participation nature is what it is and what nature does is works the decay of all things into unity mm -hmm. which i think yep. is maybe where this setting connects to a conversation about theme for um for cosette as much as for anyone here she is and she's going to be a combination of many things and in this yeah. garden um, there will be some kind of unity or hope or love or new life, something coming for her and for Valjean too. That's good, which I think hmm. might be significant at the beginning of where their story is going to take us this time. It looks yeah. like a lot of dissolution, you know, it's right. decay. Yeah. It's a yeah. decay leading to unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can't pin the image down either. I like all the things that you're saying, but also the great is right. a lot like prison bars, right? right. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. You you wouldn't know that either of them lived there unless you saw them through the gate, like looking inward at a prisoner in a prison cell. Like mm -hmm. there's some some of that imagery. On the other hand, the way that Cosette's life here is described, by the way, we, just in case the reader is bewildered about what we're talking about here, since we left Cosette and Valjean in a convent, they have moved. They have moved right. from the convent. Now they live in this house with the garden. Okay, good. So the, I think well, it's we'll really, talk more about that in a minute. Yeah, 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 for sure. But I think um, she's happy there. At least until she discovers that she's beautiful. She's happy there. <laughs> she's running around. She's exploring every nook and cranny of the place. Like it's her own private little world. And so it, and it, I think that's connected to her innocence, right? Mm -hmm. It isn't a prison because she's mm -hmm. innocent. And then something mars that innocence just a hair. That isn't as though she becomes some wanton all of a sudden. But Well, it's almost like the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, if we're going to go yeah. with the Eden imagery, Ooh, yeah, while she's that. innocent, she loves to be in the garden. And yes. as soon as she knows that she's beautiful, it's broken and she right. needs to get out. You know? That's awesome. Yep. That's exactly what I was driving at. Exactly that. Like there's there's definitely her her purity and her childlikeness is what allows this to be an Edenic place. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she... Um, maybe it's just maturity. As soon as she wakes up to the world outside the mm -hmm. walls, she can see how small they are. And um, so in the light of that comment, what do you guys think of Valjean's attitude being here at Rue Plumet? Because we're told that the reason they left the convent was he didn't want to imprison her there. That um, Actually, it's a really beautiful line mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Page 872, I think. 
uh yeah at the bottom of 872 he he asked himself whether all this happiness was really his own if it were not made up of the happiness of another of the happiness of this child whom he was appropriating and plundering he an old man if this was not a robbery he said to himself that this child had a right to know what life was before renouncing it hmm. that to cut her off in advance and in some sense without consulting her from all pleasures under pretense of saving her from all trials taking advantage of her ignorance and isolation to give her an artificial vocation was an outrage to a human creature and a lie to God. Hmm. So that's good, right? Now it's not entirely selfless <laughs> because two, two lines later, um, it's revealed that the other thing motivating this decision to take Cosette out and give her a choice in the matter is the idea that if he doesn't, she may come to hate him one day. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, the reason they're at Rue Plumet is because Valjean has done something for the sake of Cosette. Right. Right. So how is his himself imprisonment in danger. there going? Right. What do you guys think? How does the, how does Rue Plumet or Plumet 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 plummet plummet? How does this place affect Valjean? I think it's interesting that you compared it to a prison house. I hadn't thought of that, but it, that resonates with a lot of the other imagery we get in our reading for today. At the, I, I believe it's at the end of this third book where he sees the prison prisoners marching mm -hmm. with Cosette. And I, I couldn't help but think that he, he's looking at them out from outside as someone who used to be a prisoner, but I kind of get the feeling that he still is one of them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that he's in some kind of spiritual prison as well. Mm -hmm. um, we learn things like uh, as he begins to wrestle with <laughs> this push me, pull you with Marius, he begins to think things like he thought he was past having malevolent feelings towards people, but he is rediscovering them in his own heart. Um, so I think there is something of the convict haunting him again here hmm. it's a grabby frantic attitude he's what's so different about this next phase is that he's in danger of being replaced in his own mind he thinks he is yeah yeah, yeah for sure as he watches her grow beautiful that's kind of the next the, the thing that that turns from our discussion of the house itself and the garden and all of the metaphysics that Hugo brings up um, into more plot is that Cosette wakes up and realizes that she's beautiful. She's grown beautiful kind of overnight. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me, uh, dude, here I am being a dude, but I'd never, I wondered how you guys were going to take the way he described this process for her, because more or less what he says is, when a young girl realizes that she's beautiful, it necessarily makes her, how do you pronounce the word? Um, C O Q U E T T E coquettish, coquettish, mm -hmm. Coquette. coquettish. <laughs> um, what does that mean? First of all, doesn't it mean like a uh, flirtatious pleased with yourself and aware of your power? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Negative word, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is looking up and realizing that you're beautiful, does that automatically make you a worse person <laughs> as a young woman? Like I, that just felt a little harsh to me. It felt a little aggressive maybe. Um, well, he, he really doubles down. He calls it a weapon. Mm -hmm. She realizes that she has a weapon and can wield it. And he says that women play with their beauty as children do with knives. I don't know what kind of children he's interacting with, but the children I know don't play with <laughs> knives. That's a no, no. But anyways, he says that the danger is the same, that they would wound themselves with it. Hmm. So, but it's, uh, he, on 88, he describes what replaces that innocence. Uh, he says, in learning that she was beautiful, Cosette lost the grace of not knowing it, an exquisite grace for beauty heightened by art artlessness is ineffable, and nothing is so adorable as dazzling innocence going quite about her business and holding in her hand quite unconsciously the key to paradise. But what she lost in ingenuous grace, she gained in pensive and serious charm. Her whole person, pervaded by the joys of youth, innocence, and beauty, breathed a splendid melancholy. Hmm. And so the the process of maturing is the process of gaining melancholy. Hmm. And Interesting. I don't think that that is necessarily uh, 
to be avoided. I was going to say not an mm. evil. I do think that he would see suffering as an evil, but that is just, it's part of the human condition that is necessary for depth and gravity and yeah, the, yeah. the elements of maturity. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, I suppose in the context of your comment there, that makes the comments about the garden even more beautiful because more or less maturity, the onset of melancholy, the onset of adulthood kicks you out of Eden. And, mm. and that's just, that's another facet of the human experience. I mean, as soon as Cosette realizes that she's beautiful, the garden is no good anymore. She doesn't spend as much time there. Um, because I'm, because she's infatuated with herself at that point, that's strongly put, but, um, it is strongly put some of the, because some of the charm. I noticed that she spent more time then, and this is obviously after Jean Valjean gets hurt. He's burned himself in the house with the Tenardiers in that whole episode, and he's mm -hmm. wounded then for weeks. And she spends all of her time not in the garden anymore, but back in his little prison cell with him. Right. And I think on the one hand, you could see that as a negative move. If we're thinking very thematically about these settings, she's gone to prison in some ways. She's <laughs> out of Eden and she's in prison, right? But also Along her motivation for humanity. being there is to right, to minister to someone else who is suffering. Yeah. Here right. she is and her heart is hurt in some ways by the maturing process and all the things but her impulse is to find another sufferer and ease his suffering and i think that's a, a positive quality so always th these truths in tension in this right. whole section today yeah that's kind of beautiful uh it's a i it's a brave man who goes to write an account of the impact of puberty on a young woman <laughs> hats, hats oh, off yeah. to you go well done my my dude um, okay, so what is the big conflict of this section, right? Mm -hmm. Cosette has discovered that she's beautiful. Maybe that's made her soul a little bit deeper. She's realized she has a weapon, but who exactly is she using the weapon on? Mm. He says something interesting about how she wasn't ready for like the full-blown thing, meaning love, but that, um, I forget where it is, but she needed a vision Marius is a vision to her, a dream, mm. but not solid yet. Yep. Can't find it either, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, found it. Page 891. In this condition, it was not a lover she needed. It was not even an admirer. It was a vision. She began to adore Marius as something charming, luminous, and impossible. Mm. Charming, luminous, and impossible. Which is exactly <laughs> what he's doing to her, by the way. It sounds like yep. Joe yep. March. <laughs> it's much more like chivalric love or like, uh, you know, Dante and Beatrice than yeah. it is like a real relationship. Yeah, but nonetheless, uh, authentic for that, right? Hugo even digresses at one point and says, we in the modern era, it's funny, he's living in the modern era, according to himself, right? We in the modern <laughs> mm -hmm. era, don't we discount the power of a glance. It's a popular thing to make fun of. And yet <laughs> this is exactly how love starts. All love starts this way. And yeah, basically he says, um, don't be a tired old person. Take it seriously. These two <laughs> fell madly in love with one another over a glance. And that's what happened. And I get to write the book. So that is how it went, which I kind of liked. That was fun. Yeah. I like that too. It is. It, um, it makes the musical a little more palatable. Or at, or at least the, the the sequence in the musical, right? It, it, they, it's like a instant. They fall in love, and it's immediate and ooey gooey. But like here, it, like in the musical, that's genuinely supposed to be romantic. In the book, it's a little facetious, right? This is still mm -hmm. a process in which Cosette is coming out of childhood. And she has to be led out of childhood by the vision before it can be the real thing. And hmm. so it's a little, it's a little childish. Not that she can avoid it, but it is what it is. Yeah. And that's kind of what I meant going back to my comment about Hugo being a bold man here, because what he's trying to do is tell the truth about her childishness, but also acknowledge the fact that um, the things that children feel are still, still affect the world and, hmm. and the people around them and they have consequences. Right. So yeah. And it seems like he's walking that tightrope relatively well. I couldn't quite tell if he was laughing behind his hand at the two of them or if he was defending them from people who were laughing behind their hands with them. And that's cool. I, I think maybe both. He does allow Jean Valjean to call Marius a booby, 
who's in love with Cosette, <laughs> okay, even though Cosette so, doesn't okay. know that he exists. I think maybe all bets are off now. Here's the, here's right. So Valjean's whole perspective on this, uh, by the way, I think it was kind of brilliant for Hugo to give us the whole story of the walks in Luxembourg gardens Yeah. Um, from the perspective of Marius and then go away and talk about some other stuff for like uh, 200 pages or whatever, <laughs> and then come back and give us that whole story again from the other perspective, from the Valjean and Cosette pers perspective. I really liked the contrast of that. Um, and so how does Valjean's read on this scenario contribute to whether Hugo is defending or supporting the young lovers or both. Hmm. Cause it, cause Valjean is not super reliable on this point. Right. Well, on the one hand, he sees the situation more clearly than either of the two lovers. Like Marius yes. and Cosette are silly and stupid and obvious. And Jean Valjean is the wise father who, who lays every trap he can think of to assure himself that Marius is into Cassette and Marius falls into every single one of them. So on the <laughs> one hand, he's very aware and wise and mature, but he's also selfish and, um, you know, concerned that his own happiness will be upended by this. So right. any, any actions that he takes to protect Cosette as from an evil, maybe we should, you know, be suspicious of. But well, he's yeah, right and, to notice what's going on. Oh, for certainly. And and I mean, the man spent his whole life on the run. He's He knows what he's looking at when he sees it, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an interesting element of it where there was a line, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, but um, where Hugo talks about nature and how nature is a great mother. And she warned Valjean that someone was, gonna, was coming for his daughter. And he wasn't mm -hmm. really sure who it was, but he could just tell, just like, sort of psycho-spiritually. He could tell that somebody was <laughs> on the hunt for his daughter, right? Okay. That same yeah. mother warns Marius that the father is aware of the scenario. And so he keeps it secret, mm. right? And um, so nature's good. Back to the garden again, right? We were talking about Eden. We were talking about the fact that the natural world is in favor of all things that are living, all things that are teeming, right? There's something about mother nature that he's on about in this section. And so those things that nature is doing to Valjean and to Marius, um, those aren't bad things. Right? Am I too far afield? Right? No, I don't think so, because we get the same image of the importance of a maternal instinct to right. um, bring Cosette to maturity. And it's sadly lacking in her experience. Yeah. So I think he is having that conversation. I'm not sure where he lands on it, but she looks to Jean Valjean for things that he can't possibly offer. All of the, right. all of her needs, he, he calls it a struggle against the ignorance that we call innocence. Mm. She's trapped in an ignorance in a, in a certain way and really needs a mother. And this maybe nature is supposed to be that for her. Is that what he means? I don't know. I don't know because obviously what Valjean, for example, does with nature's leanings in this area or leadings in this area is um, fly off the handle and start muttering imprecations at Marius in his heart and saying some really crazy stuff like woe is me here's all the things that I've done to earn this happiness I earned this happiness there was it was like only a handful of chapters ago that he was talking about the gift that all of this is to him mm -hmm. right by a loving yeah. gracious God and now he's yeah, good point. screaming at the heavens about how he's earned the whole thing um and I, maybe he's doing the same thing with Kazat Hugo I mean doing the same thing with Kazat when he says okay nature does this nature takes us this far and then how we interpret, how we pursue, how we hmm. perceive what's going on jumps in and sets the course for our relationships and our lives. Or maybe this conversation about nature is supposed to tie in. It's like a very visual example of something that's very internal. Where our story goes, Jean Valjean and Cosette go for a walk and they see this convict train. I think we've mentioned mm -hmm. um, this train of convicts passing by. And the effect is very intense on Valjean. He feels like he's back again and he's thinking over um, all the worst parts of his like humanity, the lowest right. points that he's been in his life. When he was on and that Cosette, same train on that same street, right? On that same street, right. It like takes him back in time. And Cosette asks him, father, are they still men? Mm -hmm. Which made me think of nature all over again. Like, what is a man? What's the essence of of manhood are do they count they're like the lowest form of human being and um, his response is sometimes hmm. which i think is interesting given the vacillation that we've noticed already in valjean in this scene 
now he's like established and he's like a holy man. Every, everyone says he's a saint and he's perfect, but this is like a snaps him right back to who he really is down in his heart, what he's capable of, the darker elements of his nature. It's like um, he's face to face with himself again. And what he says is really honest. Um, are you a man? Well, sometimes, you know, yeah. and I'm other bad. times who knows what we are. Um, and still when Cosette says, I couldn't bear it to have one of these men near me. His response is to start hiding, right? He wants to put on his mm -hmm. fancy gilded his uniform, uniform yeah. and impress yeah. her at the fair because now he has to distance himself from that identity as much as possible mm -hmm. in order to, in his mind, earn her affection. Yeah, he's a fascinating character. So far, Jean Valjean's character development continues to be, um, I don't know, elusive and yeah um i love that about it i think that that's one of the the things that's keeping me reading that we haven't figured him out yet he didn't just undergo one transformation and become one dimensional which right. i think in a book that is truly a product of romanticism um frequently characters make one switch and then they're one dimensional yeah, and i love point. that hugo isn't doing that that is a good point he's this this guy is still figuring out who he is yeah. I like that too it's not that the author is still unfolding who this character was from the very beginning before the reader's eyes we're not just getting new information about john valjean he's getting new information about himself mm -hmm. it's really yeah. kind of an elegantly done well it's it really is human that like it, on one page he can make this incredibly like selfless uh self-knowledge oriented decision to take Cosette away from the convent mm -hmm. and then a mm -hmm. uh, pressure touches on a different part a couple pages later and he's like it takes it all back yeah. that, that's mm -hmm. just that feels very relatable oh man well it's kind of fascinating that that little moment that um brings him sight of himself and kind of freaks him out is followed by a kind of an incongruous step into Gavroche's life. Yeah. Gavroche, the yeah. little street urchin, witnesses Jean Valjean almost getting robbed in the street at night. And um, Jean Valjean gives a big, long sermon to the would-be attacker mm -hmm. about, um, well, all the things that he himself has learned about yeah. working hard. And what do you guys think of that passage? Because in this context... Is this um is this holy saint Jean Valjean? Is this gritty would be thief Jean Valjean? Like who are we talking about here? No, I don't think it's I think it's um I think it's Jean Valjean coming to terms maybe in a final way hmm. with what has happened to him in his life. I don't hmm. think it's any coincidence that it comes right after this yeah. where he sees the convict train again and um it's so interesting that he phrases all of this as a prophecy to this kid. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is what will happen to you. And then you start to recognize, mm -hmm. as you read, you start to recognize, you think sermon, 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 confession. Oh, mm. that's that's wild, right? He starts to recount the details of his own experience still yeah. as a prophecy over this young man. I know who you are and where you're going because I am you. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the fact that he ends it by handing him all his money. Me too. Yeah. As though he's trying to be the bishop, right? I loved it. Even the phrasing is the same. It's not so hard to be an honest man. Go now mm -hmm. and do what I've said to you, you know? Yeah. It's like a charge. It's like a going out like the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course it is. I love that. Love that. But it doesn't work. Hmm. Although, do do I don't know. We haven't seen that it didn't work necessarily. Well, he doesn't keep the money. The well, Martin Parnas the stands there. Um, the way that he says it is he stands there reflecting for the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's like I think that's a triumph of sorts. I didn't mean it quite that way. You're right. Of course it is. I, what did you what mean? I meant was Valjean tries to change this young man's life by giving him oh, enough money. money that oh, he won't be right. so poor that he will have to steal a loaf of bread. I got and you. End up on a prison ship, and God says that's not who the money's for. Hmm. Is basically what happens because Gavroche sneaks up behind him, and this is we're gonna have to talk Robin about Gavroche. Hood, yeah, yeah, yeah. He Robin Hoods. That he stuff, Robin right? Hoods that stuff. He sneaks up and he and he takes the money and he gives it to Monsieur Mabouf, who's who is has just had a conversation in Gavroche's hearing about the fact that he can't afford his rent. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. I mean, Gavroche came looking for food, and he still handed the money to somebody else. I don't know what you guys think about that. Oh, I know. So so fun. I guess um, he can't. 
he can't ultimately control the course of his own life. Well, I, can I say something about that? Or someone yeah. else's, right? Go ahead, Emily. Mm. He, in the prophecy that you're talking about, he's it, knowing just a little bit about what's to come in the book. There's some interesting things that he says. He tells the kid, uh, he's going to do all these things. You'll tear up your bedclothes to make a rope strip by strip. You'll hang on a thread over an abyss. To fall Whoa. as chance would have it into the abyss from whatever height onto what? Onto whatever is below, to the unknown. Or you'll climb through a chimney flue at the risk of burning yourself. Or you'll crawl through a sewer at the risk of being drowned. Yeah. Whoa! So these are these are Im- um, imprecations on the criminal, right? This is what happens to criminals. You're going to crawl in a sewer at the risk of being drowned. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I mean, I don't want to give anything away. I haven't don't. even read the rest of the book, but, you know, that should ring some bells about what's coming. Like, well, we at least know there's a famous passage on sewers. So so to what extent is he talking to himself? And when you say that he wants to have control over the situation, I think that's like he does see himself as the bishop and maybe wants to be like the bishop, but in a really larger sense, it's completely out of his hands. His mm. good deed is not his to determine. It's right. used in a different way for him. Mm-hmm. Mm. Exactly. And that, yes. And then that point is underlined with a period on the end by the fate of the money bag he hands the kid, right? It, that wasn't his decision, it turns out. And by the title of the chapter, I don't think we're allowed to forget this for one moment, that his his agency is all an illusion. The mm-hmm. title of the chapter is Aid from Below or From Above. So mm-hmm. here yeah. Jean Valjean thinks that he's the agent of change down here below and on the earth. But actually, he's just a tool in the hands of a power from above, which I think right. is lovely. Right. It's it's on the nose, as we have come well, to find yeah, from Hugo. It's on the nose in more than one way. You can read it more than one way, too. You can also Because the think, money falls from the sky. Well, the, yeah. So there's that. There's the position <laughs> of the money. That's one way. There's the way that you just said. That's just, that's another way. Right. Then there's the third way, which is Valjean considers himself having raised himself from the gutter above oh. this kid. Right? And so he tries to be helped from above, and then Gavroche <laughs> in the gutter <laughs> comes along and oh. provides help from below. <laughs> right? I love that. I hadn't thought of that third one, but that's my favorite one. It's so, <laughs> I also so think Gavroche's character is fascinating because given that he gave us a big, long talk about what the gamin is in Paris, mm-hmm. like the Paris street urchin, the spirit of the city, like the truest part of Paris, actually, mm-hmm. is this little street urchin who's just sort of his own master in every way and a little waif of the city. Gavroche in this moment is starving to death. And he's, you know, you expect him to be a little, a little scamp, a little like scoundrel. Yeah. Yes. To be exactly like his father. He's got no one to guide him. And yet, at least the way that I read it, he was one of the most, um, more like a little angel in the scene than anything else. His impulse on at every turn was to impose himself to protect people mm-hmm. and to, to be an agent of um, comfort to everyone, to save the old men that he saw. That was amazing. Yeah. yeah, super cool. Not what I expected. When he stole the money, I thought, hey, that was supposed to help this other guy turn his life around. And then he tossed it over the wall. And I was like, weird flex, but okay. Are we going to go back and get it? And then I realized it was going to land on Monsieur Mabuff and yeah. that Gavroche was actually taking care of him. That's just, it was cool. That was a great It was cool. Moment. It was really cool. I, I am worried about Gavroche though, because for goodness sake, that boy is starving to death. Yeah. It is interesting though. I, I feel like in earlier episodes, we've had kind of nurture versus nature conversations that Hugo started about mm. like where in particular about like the Tenardiers and the, the, the fact that their circumstances made them evil and bent. And mm. here we have Gavroche and Eponine, his sister who were raised in terrible circumstances by terrible parents. And yet there's this goodness in them. Where did it come from? Like, it must have just been there. Hmm. Yeah, maybe it's, yeah. I don't know if I have a great answer for that, but it, the image of God and man, maybe like there's mm-hmm. something, there's something pure in the essence of a soul and mm-hmm. it can be all layered over with filth and degradation and poor circumstances and all of that, but it's still beautiful underneath. Hmm. And it's wrapped up with the idea of freedom too, right? Because people who are truly free are free to act in, in that mm-hmm. portion of their nature. Well, that was the 
essence of the gamang is that they are free mm -hmm. even though it's mm -hmm. tragically free they are free yeah hmm. well a little bit of a shorter section for this time around but no less grand are we po are we shipping uh cosette and marius <laughs> are we pulling <laughs> Uh, poor evening. Just I don't know. Mind. I'm actually thinking on this because one of my main quarrels with the musical is that Cosette has no personality at all. I mean, mm -hmm. there's it's like a broken love triangle where no one's hoping for Cosette, but Cosette's the one who gets the man <laughs> in the end. You know, <laughs> everyone is hoping for Team Eponine because she's actually yeah. got like a heart and soul in the musical, and she's like you know gritty and real and self aware and you know self sacrificial. She's the best, you know. Yep. But um, I don't know. Here we're reading the book. And what I'm hoping for is more character development for Cosette so mm -hmm. that I understand her and I'm rooting for her and I'm happier with yep. the way that things are going to turn out, you know? Right. And I don't know yet. I think that she is still um, more of a doll than a person. Your thoughts? So is Marius. Well, is that's true. also not true in the musical. Like, and They kind of deserve each other right now. Uh, you, do you think Marius yeah. is personality less okay. in the book? Um, I mean, in this section, right? He, we we got a lot with his father. Yeah, there was a situation. lot of background on him. Yeah, I, I mean, agree with Cosette, Megan about Cosette. I think she like okay. If we'd gotten the same background for Cosette about her mother, for example, like if she had been really desperate to know about her mother, I would have identified with her some more. Except that really, what she thinks is weird, and I don't understand it. What she thinks mm -hmm. is the spirit of my mother has come down into Jean Valjean, and he is my mother. And I just think, what are you talking about, girl? You're crazy. <laughs> well, part of what's part of what's going on with her, though, I mean, a little bit, I want to say, Cosette, blink twice if you need help. Like, she basically, <laughs> she's basically been like, uh, she was sold by her mother, right? Abused by the people that bought her, mm -hmm. whisked away by a strange man in the middle of the night, yeah, and has been on the run or in a convent ever since. She doesn't she's know a little anything bit of a weird girl. The world. Yeah, there's there's yeah. no. There's really no reality. Everything about her experience has been unreal and strange and nightmarish. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I feel for her in that way, but I do hope that she becomes kind of a real person so that I can actually rejoice when, when good things happen, because right I this minute, that too. I think, cause I, uh, that's what I'm hoping for, mm -hmm. but she's more than just the, you know, the title character soprano that we need. <laughs> yeah. Who, yeah. To hit those impossibly high notes in in my life you know what i mean <laughs> that was free you're welcome everyone <laughs> well thank you both for your wonderful insights as per the usual and thank you listeners for joining us today on how to eat an elephant and we will be back next time with more discussions on victor hugo's limits <laughs> in the meantime bon appetit bon appetit, bon appetit. <laughs>